Uh, Aurelien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me here. I really apologize for not being here today. Uh, sorry, teaching load is just too heavy. Uh, so I even more appreciate uh, the opportunity to 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 present this work. So um, I, I I believe uh, there are Spintronics experts in the room. So you probably have already heard part of this of this presentation. So we'll try to add some uh, new stuff. Um, of course, I have to start with uh, a tale of spin charge and uh, an orbit, just to position uh, to position this work. And I think it's always good. Uh, I've been keeping telling about the same thing for the past couple of years, but I think it's always good to 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 come back to the uh, to the basics and uh, remind ourselves what uh, what spin is and what magnetism is. And and really, magnetism is about angular momentum. And this is, of course, well um, illustrated by the einstein de Haas experiments. You know, when you take a paramagnet that is, um, well, we, with random magnetic moments, and when you magnetize uh, this uh, this uh, paramagnets. Oops, sorry. Okay. No, <laughs> let's do it again. Uh, yeah, when you magnetize these paramagnets, this magnet this magnetization process comes with. Um, uh, a mechanical torque, and you can actually measure this mechanical, me, me, mechanical torque, which really proves that magnetizing a system is the same thing or is equivalent to um, to bringing orbital uh, angular momentum. Now, of course, you have the uh, opposite effect, which is the, uh, the uh, Barnett effect, where um, instead of uh, magnetizing these paramagnets, you rotate it. And if you rotate it fast enough, you can actually magnetize it. Okay, so this equivalence really shows that magnetism has to do with angular momentum. And I think it's very important that we keep it in mind, especially when we start talking about spin orbit coupling, because it's really about uh, harvesting the orbital degree of freedom, transferring it uh, to the spin and do some nice and funny physics with it. Um, so, uh, of course, one of the, uh, the probably the most uh, beautiful, um, uh, the most beautiful demonstration or uh, of of this uh, angular momentum conservation is the spin transfer torque that was proposed by Luc Berger and John Sozuski. And here I'm going to talk about the uh, Sozuski's picture. Um, so his idea is the following. So you take a you take a, a, a metallic uh, metallic magnet. So the total angular momentum of this material should be conserved, of course, and because the magnetism has two contribution, the local magnetization and the uh, contribution from the conduction spin, then the total, uh, the, the sum of both contribution should be a constant in principle. Of course, here I'm putting a lot of things under under, under the carpet, so we can talk about that later. Uh, I didn't talk about orbital magnetism and stuff like that, but you know, if you just take this picture, you probably get uh, 80 to 90 percent of the physics right. Now. If you find a way to uh, vary the, um, the conduction spin as a function of time, then you should automatically have a variation of the magnetization of the local magnetization as a function of time. Okay, so you really, because again, this degree must be a conserved quantity. So uh, concretely, if you take a piece of magnetic metal and send a spin current through it, whose spin, the spin of this conduction electron in this case is misaligned with the magnetic order, in this case, those spins will penetrate inside the magnetic material, will precess, and uh, at the end, at the exit of this material, these uh, spins will be aligned with the magnetization. Okay, so what you end up with is a spin current, is an outgoing spin current whose polarization is aligned on the magnetization. And um, what John Sozuski um, stated is that uh, the imbalance between the incoming spin current and the outgoing spin current is simply an angular momentum transfer from the conduction electron to the local magnetization. And this, of course, from the magnetization perspective, is nothing but a torque, a magnetic torque. So uh, in other words, if you have a spin polarized current, you can use it to torque magnetization. And that's really based on angular momentum conservation. Now, I mean, this... Um, this mechanism, uh, you probably are, are already heard about that, is, is, a, is a very powerful mechanism in spintronics. It has been realized in many different kind of configurations. Here, I'm just showing an old version of um, a magnetic tunnel junctions that is used for uh, magnetic memories. And what you see that you actually need a polarizer, right, to first polarize your spin current. And your polarizer is right here. This is just a very thin layer here. 
Now you have your MGO barrier that's separated from the free layer and the free layer where you code the information, sorry, is right here. This is this guy. Okay, that's my blue layer here. Is this, I try to follow the, the to follow the, the arrow is, is right this, just this layer here. And what you actually see that on this device, you have many, many layers and you have many layers because you need, you know, for, you need to have the good, good growth properties. You need to have good magnetic properties. Uh, so at the end of the day, you need all these layers just to stabilize the polarizer and the, um, the, 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 the free layer. So the, the question that we um, asked ourselves um, a few years ago was, well, is there any way to get rid of, um, of this polarizer and directly harvest the orbital moment of the electron? And the answer is, of course, yes. And you can do that if you harvest the spin orbit coupling at interfaces. And that's, that's really the, the, the topic of, of today's presentation. So, well, the spin transfer torque, the regular one, the one without spin orbit coupling, is uh, work this way. So you have this spin valve, you have the polarizer I was mentioning, you have the spacer, you have the free layer. And if you send a current of unpolarized spins inside, you get polarization and then transfer of negative momentum, and you can control the magnetization. Now, if you want to get rid of the polarizer, you actually have to change the configuration. And this is something that has been um, really one of the most active, uh, active topic of spintronics. Uh, the idea that you take a heavy metal where you have a lot of orbital moments that you can harvest uh, and you, you deposit a ferromagnet on top of it. And when you do that, it will basically send a current in your system. And this current will be accompanied by different effects, among which spin hole effect, okay, which is simply the separation of up and down spin. So this creates a spin current that is absorbed by the ferromagnets, and it creates a torque on these ferromagnets. Okay, so you just change the configuration compared to the traditional spin valve, and uh, all the interesting physics is happening right below inside the heavy metal. This could be, you know, platinum or tungsten, this kind of things. Uh, and of course, this cartoon is not completely correct because I'm completely missing what's happening at this right at this interface where you also have some interesting rush by effect. I'm going to, something I'm going to talk uh, a bit more about. Now, there is actually a very interesting reciprocal effect. And I think it's important to point out that both effects should be really consider on equal footing because they are uh, reciprocal of each other. Now imagine that you find a way to make this magnetization precess. Let's say you excited with a ferromagnetic resonance at, at ferromagnetic resonance. Now this magnetization is going to precess and by precessing is going to pump a spin current into the heavy metal. Now the inverse process is going to happen. You're going to combine, you're going to convert the spin current into a charge current. And this is called a spin battery. Okay, the precess the precessing magneti magnetization creates a voltage drop uh, through the I mean across your sample. Now there is a third interesting effect that is again I mean the, the, the three effects are really um, present all together in those in those very simple structures, which is chiral magnetism. Uh, actually, because of the in in inversion symmetry breaking at the interface, the spin orbit coupling adopts a very particular form that I'm going to talk about in more details. And uh, as a consequence, the exchange between local, mag uh, local magnetic moments will be anti-symmetric. And this anti-symmetric exchange will stabilize chiral magnetism. So chiral spin textures or uh, yeah, spin textures like, uh, like uh, um, skirmions, uh, spin spirals, and, and then this, kind, this kind of thing. Um, so the the important aspect is that you always need a, a, a heavy metal, and I'm only going to talk about that today. Uh, what is very interesting too is that you see you have a decoupling between the direction of the spin current and the direction of the charge current. So it means that you can send a spin current in pretty much anything. Could be a metal, it could be an insulator, it could be an anti-ferromagnet, it could be quite complex, whatever you want, and that is actually very very powerful. So. Uh, what what you need is to combine magnetism with this interfacial inversion symmetry breaking and spin orbit coupling. Okay, so let's try to have a look uh, a bit more closely to what this spin orbit coupling is, and it's basically what kind of form it takes at these interfaces. So as I mentioned, what we want is to harvest the angular momentum uh, the uh, uh, of the orbital degree of freedom and transfer it into the spin degree of freedom, okay? It's like when you're on your bike, you want to turn left, you have to bend left, or if you want to turn right, you have to bend right, okay? Uh, so 
let's start with what, what the spin orbit coupling is, because that's really the, the workhorse of this, of this transfer. So we take a charged particle with the momentum P, and this charged particle flows in, uh, un in an environment with an, electrical, uh, with an electrical field. Now, in the frame of motion of your charged particle, this particle would experience a magnetic field, such, such a simple relativity, E cross P. Now, because this charged particle has a spin, you can have a Zeeman effect between the spin of this charged particle and the magnetic field. Uh, and the Zeeman effect will, uh, will basically, yeah, so that you have the spin uh, degree of freedom here, the potential gradient, which is simply the electric field, and P, which is your, your momentum. Okay, that's what happens. Uh, that's, your, that's the basic form of your, your spin orbit coupling. Now, if you look at an atom, then the potential gradient is mostly spherical. Uh, sorry, the potential is mostly spherical, so the, the gradient is mostly radial, which means that the gradient here will simply be something proportional to the radius of your, uh, to the radial direction of your of your atom, which means that you can, um, you can boy, I mean, you can reduce your spin orbit coupling to this uh, Russell Sanders form, which couples the spin to the orbital degree of freedom. Okay, I know this is really the orbital um, the orbital angular momentum that, that is involved in this, in this expression. And if you actually look at a crystal, most of the spin orbit coupling, and we're talking about 99% of the spin orbit coupling, is happening close to, uh, in the vicinity of the atom. It's not coming from the crystal field. And there was some misunderstanding uh, uh, at a time about that. It's really uh, a research standard form of the spin orbit coupling. Now, the question is, how does the block states that travel in your crystal, how do these block states experience this spin orbit coupling? How do you imprint this spin orbit coupling on the, on the bulk states? So I take this um, atomic spin orbit coupling and I project it on the block states. And what I should have, that I will end up with a Zeeman, term, with a Zeeman uh, coupling, which is uh, between the spin of your, of your states and a momentum dependent effective field. Okay, this is just, just mathematical, just one step, okay? So this is what the spin orbit coupling does, okay? It, it actually creates an effective field to which the spin, it tends to align. Now, the question is, what is the form of this effective field, depending on the symmetry of the system? So if you have inversion symmetry, so the magnetic field does not depend on the sign of your momentum, okay? It's basically, it's, it's, it's essentially even momentum. Which means that the influence will be of this uh, of this uh, term is to create an anomalous velocity that is sometimes uh, expressed in terms of the the the, the Berry curvature. Okay, and this anomalous velocity you see is perpendicular to the uh, canonical velocity, and depends on the spin. It depends on the spin because of um, of this term in your Zeeman effect. So in other words, if I send a current in a system where, that, where I'm going to have spin orbit coupling, electrons with uh, let's say positive spin will go one way and the electron with negative spin will go the other way just because the anomalous velocity will change sign. Now you can, um, I will come back to, to the some concrete realization of that in, a, in, in real life. Now, if I break the inversion symmetry, let's say at an interface, then this magnetic field is not equivalent anymore in, to, in, the, in the both um, signs of your quasi-momentum. So in other words, uh, if I take an interface, I'm going to see that in a minute. If I take an interface, my spin orbit coupling, the one that is experienced by my block state, will take this particular form, this Rajba form, where now the spin is connected, is coupled to an effective field that is linear in K, okay, linear in momentum. So in other words, if I send the current along one particular direction, the spin will align on this particular direction, okay? And this is called the, I mean, there are different names. I personally favor uh, the inverse spin galvanic effect. Uh, I know that uh, another term in the community is the, uh, the inverse the rush by Lestein effect. Um, so that's uh, essential. That the, I mean, these two, these two effects, so creating a pure spin current or pure spin density out of equilibrium, is really coming from this uh, atomic spin orbit coupling, and it's it's quite, I mean, it's present in a, in, in a very wide variety of of systems. Now let's look at you know if you want to picture it concretely, what this uh, spin hole effect is. This is actually nothing but the Magnus force. Okay, so if you rotate a ball uh, in a, in a flow of fluid then the rotation of the ball will uh, make the fluid, I mean, the, the velocity of the fluid with respect to the ball will be different on both sides, and you actually end up with this, um, this uh, transverse force that pushes the ball on the side. 
Now, if you want to cancel this uh, transverse force, this Magnus force, what you need to do is to make the ball rotate along the trajectory of the ball. And that's how you could picture this inverse galvanic, this inverse spin galvanic effect. Okay, now let's try to have a bit more uh, of, a, of a microscopic understanding of this, of, this, of this effect. So I'm going to take a chain of atom and I will put two orbitals because I know that the orbital character is absolutely crucial. You know, I need a sigma dot L. So I need an L to start with. So I take a chain and I put two, um, two atomic orbitals. I'm going to put a PZ and a PX. So of course they don't couple with each other, okay? Uh, and they don't carry by themselves an orbital momentum. If I want to create an orbital momentum, I need to mix up PZ and PX. And if I want to mix them up, I need to add another chain. Okay, I'm just going to add another chain with some other orbitals. I don't really need to specify the kind of orbitals I have on top of here. What I need is that this chain will now couple the PZ with the PX. And I'm going to have a superposition of PX and PZ on each of these atoms which creates an orbital moment along the y direction. So out of the, of, of the plane of this, of this slide. Now, what I can, what I can show is that uh, actually, if you look at the, um, the hopping between the, the PX uh, orbital and the PX orbital, you know, you go from one phase to the other phase. So basically hopping from this atom to, from the bottom atom to the top or from the top to the bottom, introduce a change of phase in your hopping parameter which creates uh, an orbital moment that is linear or that is odd in momentum kx. So of course, it's, uh, I'm going very, very fast here because I just want to show you the, the, the essential architecture of uh, the Rashba effect. Now, once I have this orbital moment that is linear in momentum, then I simply need to couple it uh, to the spin through the spin orbit coupling. And once I have that, then I end up with my Rashba spin orbit coupling. Uh, so that's one scenario. There is another one uh, where, when, where, where the, you have an interfacial uh, potential drop that creates some stark effect on, the, on, on each uh, atomic site. And this effect, of course, is, has, been, uh, has been studied, in, uh, uh, has been actually uh, observed experimentally in uh, the surface of gold. And we have, uh, over the past uh, years, uh, tried to understand how they how this Rajba effect behave in different materials. So we actually look at, for example, the uh, density functional theory. We looked at uh, interfaces between 4D and 5D metals and a monolayer of cobalt, try to identify the uh, Rajba splitting on the band structure. You see it's a very complex band structure, nothing to do with this very simple quadratic dispersion that you have uh, at the surface of gold. Okay, things are very much complicated. And we actually have, uh, well, proposed a way to to compute or to, to get some um, qualitative understanding about the behavior of the Rajba term. And we indeed obtain that uh, we have this uh, systematic increase of the Rajba term uh, when you increase the number of electrons uh, of your 4D and 5D metal. And of course, you have a very strong Rajba term at the platinum cobalt interface. That's actually the strongest you can get. What is interesting is what happens when you go for topological insulators, you know, when you have these direct cones. Uh, this is a, so now we actually do the, something a bit different. We take, we fix the topological insulator and we change the 3D element on, on top of it. So here we have the spin texture of the Fermi surface for the, uh, when we put a manganese monolayer, and this is when we put cobalt monolayer. And we can again quantify uh, the, the Rajba effect for, uh, that is acquired by those magnetic materials. Uh, this is this, uh, the, the, the blue, uh, the blue uh, blue symbols here. The red symbol is the magnetism, and what we see that there is some kind of anti-correlation between the magnetism of your element. So of course it's very strong for manganese, for example, and the Rajba effect on that is felt by these elements. So in this particular scenario, the bismuth selenide imprints the Rajba effect on the 3D material. So if, if you want to have a strong Rajba effect, you better go for cobalt and nickel. And if you want to have a lot of magnetism, you better go for uh, manganese or chromium. And this is actually what is done in the, in the, in the literature. Now there is, uh, let's move on and let's consider that what I have is my uh, very simple bi, I mean, diatomic chain, uh, but no, my, the, the bottom chain is magnetic. Okay, so if it is magnetic, then it carries magnetic moments. And uh, if I have no magnet, if I have no spin orbit coupling in my system, then 
I could consider that at equilibrium, I have electrons flowing from the left to the right and from the right to the left. So if they, if they flow from the left to the right, uh, this magnetic moment on the right will absorb the spin that is transferred by electron coming from the left. And that will exact a torque that tends to align the right magnetic moment on the left. And then you have the same scenario on the other side. So uh, at equilibrium, if there is no spin orbit coupling, then you end up with a regular exchange, you know, fermitic exchange, in, at least in this very simple model. Now, if you have spin orbit coupling, then you have all this Rajbas scenario as I was mentioning previously, then the electron flow that flow from left to the right, I, I would just take this parallel configuration as a, I just assume that this one is stronger, this exchange is stronger. Then uh, the electrons that are coming from the uh, left to the right is aligned, of course, uh, on the left magnetic moment. And because of the Rajba field, it will precess around the Rajba field. Okay, it precesses there and then is absorbed by the right element, by the right magnetic moment. So this actually creates a torque on the other direction, that it counts the the it counts the magnetic moment away from the left uh, magnetic moment. You can do the same on the uh, electron coming from the right. They will precess the other way around because the Rajba effect is anti-symmetric in momentum, in uh, in momentum k. And then again, I'm going to have this uh, torque in the other direction. And then I end up with an exchange that tends to count the spins of the magnetic moment away from each other. And this is called the jaruzinski moria interaction. Okay, so this jaruzinski moria interaction is also present when uh, at interfaces between heavy metals and ferromagnet, for example. Uh, so you can stabilize uh, homochiral spin spirals. You can stabilize skirmions. Uh, at room temperature also, stable skirmions or metastable skirmions. I'm not going to talk too much about the skirmion physics, uh, but uh, what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do, do is that I'm just going to focus on the, the the microscopic physics of those of those two effects. We have actually uh, performed calculations again, density functional theory calculation in collaboration with uh, Bluger's group in Ulich, uh, when we look at the spin spiral dispersion for uh, many different kind of combinations, depending, you know, different uh, 4D or 5D matures as well as different 3D metals. And we end up with the systematic uh, enhancements of the Joseph Schemaria for the manganese ion and very small Joseph Schemaria for nickel, for example, or even cobalt. And we can understand that by uh, by uh, the presence, uh, by basically the, the the portion of the density of state that is due to the five D character, and the portion of the density of state that is that is due to the three D character. If you take manganese tungsten, okay, manganese tungsten is uh, right here. That's the best Joseph scheme I can get. You have a lot of five D electrons at the Fermi level from tungsten, so a lot very strong spin orbit character, and enough magnetism. Okay. Now, if you go for nickel tungsten, nickel tungsten, oops, sorry, nickel tungsten has a small Joseph area, and that's because you have too much of a nickel. Okay, nickel has a lot of 3D electrons at the Fermi level, so the compromise is not is not great, and you end up with uh, kind of a weak Joseph area. Okay, so this is kind of this kind of scenario can be understood just just by uh, you know hands waving arguments, at least for, uh, based on those on those calculations. Things can be more complicated if you go for real uh, heterostructures. Um, so now, if I if if I I just want to show you a few calculations about the spin orbit torque, uh, what we can do in this uh, in those materials. So we have developed some uh, uh, multi-orbital time binding uh, framework where we have we can model bilayers or if actually more than that uh, of this form where we have a heavy metal on a ferromagnet. And what I like about this kind of model is that the spin orbit coupling is really the atomic spin orbit coupling. So it's like a DFT code but much, much simpler. So of course, much less accurate for, for sure, but it's very easy to manipulate and it's much more transparent in my in my view. So we're gonna have in this code, spin hole effect, rush by effect, Joseph Schemaria, everything coming from the atomic spin orbit coupling. So this is the kind of spin density profile we can get in this system. So I send a current uh, along, let's say the X direction, the magnetization is along the Z direction, and this is going to create uh, through spin hole effect and rush by effect, uh, this is going to create a profile of the spin density along the y and the z direction. And uh, so I will not enter too much of the details, but basically when we vary the thickness of the heavy metal, we can see that uh, this component of the spin density is purely interfacial, completely flat. So this is really coming from the Rajba effect. 
whereas this component spreads into the material. So it actually has a contribution that is purely interfacial plus a contribution that is coming from the spin hole effect. So we can actually uh, vary the structures and try to better understand uh, the experiment through this kind of, of effect. Uh, what is interesting also, and that, that will be my, my last point on, on this on this aspect, is that um, your your the torque the that you apply on the magnetization has two components. He has a component that is called like that is a field like torque. So it's really like a field essentially, uh, and, and and a component that is like a damping torque. It's called a damping torque, and it's very efficient to switch magnetization. So in summary. Uh, if you look at these kind of uh, bilayers, you have heavy metal and a ferromagnet on top of it, you're going to have essentially, uh, you know, spin hole effect in your heavy metal, as I said. Uh, you're going to have some uh, interfacial rash bar effect right at the interface, and this should give you some torque, to, some means to manipulate the magnetization. And there have been really a lot of very exciting results uh, that actually started in, uh, uh, by results from SpinTech and from Cornell where they were able to show that uh, in this uh, platinum cobalt uh, bilayer, you can actually switch the magnetization just by sending a current through the system. And you have this very nice queer loop. And you can also excite uh, this magnetization and uh, obtain some uh, gigahertz uh, um, oscillations. So it's a very rich field, especially because of this very specific configuration I was mentioning. You can talk pretty much whatever you want because the current is the charge current is decoupled from the direction of the spin current uh, and that is a very very uh, interesting aspect uh, of this uh, of this field now i'd like to move on uh, to um, to uh, breaking more symmetries okay uh, up till now the only thing i was mentioning is okay let's break the interfacial symmetry so let's put let's take a heavy metal and put a ferromagnet on top of it and, and we don't care about any other symmetry breaking now, what is interesting is that when we start breaking more symmetries, then the response tensor of your torque is much more complex. And you start having much more, uh, in, uh, much more possibilities uh, of engineering. Uh, so this is an example of the, of the tensor response that you can get for different point groups. Uh, I just give you directly two, two examples. I think that would be much more, much more uh, uh, illustrative. So if you take, for example, the manganese nickel uh, antimony, uh, this one is a is a is a bulk ferromagnet. Okay, it's a, it's not it's not a thin film. I mean, so, and it has inversion symmetry breaking. And if you look at the point group, you should actually have a form of the torque that is like that. This is called the Dressel house. So you should actually, when you send a current in this direction, the the field should be in this direction. When you send a current in this forty five degree direction, the field should be in this direction. Okay, you have this kind of uh, profile here. And when you actually do the measurement, you have something that is much more complex. That is coming from the uh, uh, from the cooperation between the Rajba field and the Dresselhaus field. Okay, and this is really something you can do just by looking at the symmetry of your crystal. What I find even more interesting is what happens in those uh, tungsten ditellurium per per permalloy bilayer. Now, in this system, if you look at tungsten ditellurium, of course there is inversion symmetry breaking at the interface, but on top of that, there is mirror symmetry uh, only normal to the A direction, okay? Along the B direction, crystallographic direction, there is no mirror. And this actually means that when you send a current inside the mirror or perpendicular to it, you are not going to generate the same kind of torques. And there have been some experiments from Cornell, also from my good colleague uh, in, in Kaost, uh, Shang Zhang, where uh, they were able to demonstrate the existence of a perpendicular um, damping-like torque, as well as a very asymmetric, uh, an isotropic, sorry, feed-like torque. Now, uh, what I want to spend a bit more time on is this recent experiment from Jingshen Chen that is using this uh, symmetry breaking to obtain some very beautiful uh, results. So he's using this L11 uh, crystal, okay, where you have this copper platinum, cobalt platinum. It's a very beautiful epitaxial system. Uh, you have this uh, threefold symmetry plus a mirror symmetry only along this direction. Okay, no, you have a symmetry breaking along this direction. And what they do is that they basically look at the torque. So they try to switch the magnetization, the magnetization by injecting the current along different directions, but without applying any, any magnetic field. Okay, so there is no magnetic field. And what they obtain is that along, let's say, low symmetry direction, they can switch without any magnetic field. Along a high symmetry direction, there is no way they can switch. And then when they 
carry on uh, injecting the current on a different direction, you know, the polarity changes. So positive, zero, negative, zero, positive, zero, and so on and so forth. And they, got, they, uh, and they obtained this os oscillatory behavior. And we were able to, to explain it by looking at the, at the point group of this system. This, uh, this uh, L11 system bilayer has a C3V symmetry, which means that, you know, you have the threefold rotation plus mirror symmetry breaking. And when we compute it, uh, so uh, the, the, the Fermi surface of the system, we have a very strong warping, you see? It's a very, very clear, it's not, I mean, the, it's not circular at all. It's, it's, it's very hexagonal. And, uh, and, and this warping creates, in fact, a new torque. So you, here you find the, the, the feedback torque or the damping torque I was mentioning before. But because of this very specific symmetry breaking, you're going to have a new torque that is a very weird form and that is exactly responsible for this switching. So I'm not entering in all the details here of the dynamics. Uh, you can look at this paper or at the previous one, for example. Uh, and we were actually able to compute from density functional theory, the magnitude of this torque. And um, what we get is that the 3M torque, I mean, this new torque has about the same size as the damping torque. And this is really something that is very surprising and we were not expecting that. Uh, and that actually explained this very beautiful experiment. Now you can also move on and look at what happens for the Josephson moria interaction. So we did that for uh, a monolayer of iron three, germanium, terium two. Uh, and in this system, oh, sorry, excuse me. I'm still, I'm still at the spin torque. Uh, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm still talking about the spin torque. I'm sorry for that. Actually, this 3M torque exists also in this uh, iron three, germanium, terium two. But here you have a mirror symmetry that kills the damping and the feel like torque. Those guys go away in this uh, FGT monolayer. Only the 3M torque survives. And this is something that was proposed by Bratas a couple of years ago uh, and has been uh, observed experimentally as, as far as I, as I understand this experimental paper, at least. Now, if I stay on this iron 3 germanium 2 and look at the Joseph schema interaction, I can also look at the symmetry and uh, using the character table of the uh, of the point group of this uh, monolayer, I can extract the different form of the Josephson schema interaction. The problem I have now is that none of this form is what we call a Lifshitz invariant. So none of this form can stabilize topological textures. Okay, so it means that actually at the long range there is a Josephson schema interaction, but it is not stabilizing anything interesting. However, at the short range we could show that uh, doing density functional theory calculation, we could show that, you know, uh, if, you, if you look, let's say, at the, the low symmetry direction here, going from this magnetic atom to this one, you can go it through two paths, either this one or this one. So this guy is uh, germanium, this one is tellurium. And what you see that because of this dissimilar path, you're going to create a perpendicular Joseph schemaria. And this perpendicular joint scheme area can stabilize in plane spin spiral, but that's only happening at short range. So they have very high energy spin spirals. So um, I, I have, uh, I will now move on to the last part of this presentation. I don't exactly know how long I have. I have been told that there's plenty of time, but you are probably super hungry. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so give me two minutes and then I wrap the, <laughs> I wrap the presentation. <laughs> two minutes is fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. So uh, I'd like to address a last effect that we uncovered recently, and I think it's super exciting. Uh, I'm going to focus on the spin to charge conversion. Okay, so just this bilayer, spin to charge conversion. Now, as I said, um, when you send a current through a system, it generates a spin current, it's absorbed, it gives a torque, and the opposite is that when your magnetization processes, it's inject a spin current and produces a charge current through inverse spin galvanic effect, through an um, inverse spin hall effect. Now, uh, the spin current that is generated by this magnetization has this particular form, okay? It's a form that you can compute from, let's say, um, sca um, um, uh, scattering, um, scattering metric theory, for example, that has been done by Bratas. And you can use this processing mag magnetization as a spin pump, as a spin battery. Now, if you add spin orbit coupling in a system, then this spin current will be will be will be transformed into a charge current, and then you can create a, we can create actually a voltage transverse. I mean, in this in this direction. Now, let's imagine that this magnetization processes around the z direction, for instance. 
you can just inject the uh, the form of the magnet ma magnetization here, and what you end up with is two components. You have a component that is a DC component that is simply the DC pumping. You will get a DC voltage, and it's a rectified voltage that has been measured by many people. And you also have an AC component that is actually has the same frequency as the magnetization. This one is much more difficult to, to, to measure. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there have been only three groups have, uh, have done it. So here is a result by uh, Olivier Klein on, uh, on Michel Viret, where you actually get a spin pumping that is homodyne to the magnetization dynamics. Now, what I want to do is change the strength of the spin orbit coupling. So what we did is that we took this uh, uh, bar layer, so it's a model bar layer, and we put some Rajba spin orbit coupling and precess the magnetization. And what happens is that if there is no spin orbit coupling, the spin will try to follow the magnetization. But if there is a spin orbit coupling, each time you pump a current from the magnetization precession, this current will be accompanied by a Rajba field that itself depends on time. So you end up with a self-consistent system where uh, the magnetization pumps a current that creates a Rajba field that modifies the dynamics of the spin, that tries to basically follow the combination of the magnetization and the Rajba field, and you end up with a very complex dynamics. And when you do the calculation, what you observe is that for a very weak Rajba effect, there is AC spin pumping that's expected. There is no problem with that. But when you increase the rush by effect, you start having some harmonics showing up in the time dependence. And some of this harmonic can be gigantic. So if you Fourier transform that, you end up with, let's say, only one frequency. Then you have a small one that is coming up. And if you increase the rush by effect, you see actually more frequencies coming up. And then you actually, even at the end of the day, end up with a large, um, larger frequency, um, uh, high frequency emission. So this is something that we found uh, theoretically. There is actually a confirmation, at least in the principle, uh, by a Nikolic group. We have developed recently more uh, a kind of different theory to try to confirm this observation. And we do observe harmonic, uh, harmonic generation, a few harmonic generation in the case of uh, warping. Uh, so I think it's actually a very exciting way to uh, you know, a very, very new direction uh, on the spin, on the old spin pumping business. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, so just a bit of advertising, if you're interested uh, about learning Spintronics, if you have students who want to learn Spintronics, I have a, a series of lectures uh, online about Spintronics. We're trying to finish it this year. And finally, thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, sorry for being a bit long. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelien. Uh, so yes, we are kind of hungry, but uh... <laughs> okay. There's a question for Martin. Martin, go ahead. So my question was in the chat. Thanks, Aurelien, for this very nice talk. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on what happens to the spin to charge conversion process when the ferromagnet undergoes a phase transition to the paramagnetic state. Um, what happens, for example, to the harmonics that you just described? So what kind of phase transition? From, from ferro to paramagnetic or from ferro yes. to antiferro? No, from to ferro paramagnetic. When, when you go across the phase transition and you lose ferromagnetic ordering, and right below the phase transition, you begin to have, um, you begin to introduce, well, entropy production of the spin state uh, due to uh, increased spin disorder. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering yeah, yeah. what the impact of that is on spin to charge conversion. So um, what we know from from spin Zebeck effect, uh, from thermal spin pumping, let's say, is that there's an increase of the uh, spin to charge conversion uh, at the phase transition because uh, you have basically uh, you have much more excitations available. So uh, so there's there's an increase of efficiency. No, I don't know what would happen if I if I, if I look at, at quantum fluctuations, for example. Uh, this isn't clear for me because fluctuation means also that you have more randomness. I think it's a, it's a very, very good question. It's a very good question. Uh, just as a follow-up, I presume that if you could uh, break the fluctuation symmetry along the block sphere, then your effect would be enhanced. I talking about squeezing? Yes. Uh -huh. 
Um, so that would, I would say that that would, that would make sense if you pump with, with, with magnons, I guess. So it's a little bit different from, from the theory I showed because when you pump with magnons, then the way that the efficiency depends on the magnon wavelength. Uh, um, of course, I mean, it decreases, I, I believe, with the magnon wavelength, if I, if I remember my, my homework properly. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, squeezing should enhance. Yeah, yeah, but but I think it's uh, what you're. I mean, the, the two um, points you are mentioning are would make sense if this is the thermal pumping or this is really pumping through magnons. Mm -hmm. So so I basically, away from about this. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Mm. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions in the audience? Right here. I I, I actually have a very Maybe stupid one, but uh, you never talked about uh, temperature. Yes, so. because I'm a theorist. I work at t equals zero. <laughs> <laughs> now that's that is a very good point. Uh, I would say in most of the of the stuff I presented, the temperature. I mean, uh, magnetism is much more sensitive to temperature in the system than electrons, and most of the processes I've been talking about are um, are carried by electrons. So of course, when 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 temperature is on, uh, and then when you have magnons involved, for example, for the the in the the spin pumping case, um, uh, but I would say this is a I would tend to think it's a different regime from what I talked about. Uh, of course, temperature is super important for switching. It's it's uh, but I didn't talk too much about switching. I really talked about the spin charge conversion processes, and I would tend to think that uh, besides the trivial uh, influence of uh, electron phonon interaction for example i would tend to think that the uh, electron spin i mean the charge of spin conversion processes are rather robust against temperature okay okay thank you uh, <laughs> matthias has one uh, hi Aurelia. uh thanks for the talk wonderful exciting um, but i have a very probably naive question um is there a when you were presenting the, the impact of all the crystalline symmetries in your uh, exotic uh, germanium-based materials, um, I, I was imme immediately wondering, uh, is, the, is there a way by, um, probably not, but uh, I have no idea, we're just thinking about top of my head, is there a way to create this um, artificially, these eff effects, by, I don't know, um, patterning or... Or are the spatial scales uh, not that's the same? A, that's a very good question. Um, so let's think. Um, I would say if you want to pattern, you probably might, does, if you work on semiconducting um, materials where the, the Fermi wavelength is, is large enough, mm -hmm. you, you, might, you might be able to observe some kind of effect. Um, I, I'm not sure that the torques, for example, or the Josinski Maria, well, perhaps Josinski Maria, let me think. I mean, the thing that most of these effects are electronic effects. So it basically depends on the on your on your Fermi wavelength. So, so that, that's why I was thinking about uh, semiconductors when you have much longer Fermi wavelength. Now, if you think in terms of carol structures, uh, then it's probably easier then, I mean, you, by, by patterning the sample, then you might indeed uh, stabilize interesting uh, carrier structures. Yes, that, that's, uh, but it's probably more likely to happen in the in the Joseinsky Maria, uh, in the case of the Joseinsky Maria, rather than in the case of the spin orbit torque. That okay. would be my my guess. And and a very quick uh, last question in the um, harmonic generation, the last part of your talk. Uh, I, I missed the, um, the, the the order of magnitude of the frequencies you were talking about. Yeah, so a... yeah, so th those um, in those particular calculations, it's a very high frequency because uh, it's a time-dependent Schrödinger equation. So we need uh, the excitation frequency to be, um, I would say, comparable, or not more than two orders of magnitude smaller than the electron energy. Um, so, so we are at a very high frequency in this particular calculation. Uh, that's why we are currently trying to develop other methods 
where we, sh we should be able to model much more realistic frequency, let's say in the gigahertz range, for example. That's why, I mean, this, the last calculation I showed is, uh, is an adiabatic approximation where we take into account um, basically a gigahertz uh, excitation. So yes, because... this kind of thing is working for antiferromagnets, for example. Yeah, yeah because the, 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 the resonances of the traditional materials are sitting more in the gigahertz range than in this range, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why we, we are not trying to explore those uh, those, those those limits. Uh, I mean, we did these calculations also with a gigahertz, so it was basically much further away. Uh, we do obtain uh, very high uh, harmonics, but I would be a little bit careful with those calculations because you know your your excitation frequency is so far from your uh, from the uh, the proper frequency of the electron that uh, well you might you might have uh, convergence issues in your calculation. So um yeah so but but so the, we we're working on this uh, on trying to find ways to circumvent this uh, these these limitations. Thank you, Aurelien. I think uh, we can thank Aurelien again and all the speakers for this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.